Hi guys, welcome back. <clears throat> so this is the second week of our short course in scientific writing. If we think back, um, lecture one was basically just set up, uh, getting stuff organized, and we did some material on effective writing. Now, this lecture, or this e-lecture, is actually gonna be mostly about motivation, purpose, and audience. We'll go through some of this stuff as before, peppered in um, during the course of the lecture. Okay, for this e-lecture, you should have read unit 1.2, 1 1.2, audience and purpose of our uh, set book, um, the, the Nature English Communication for Scientists, the e-book. Now, you can read more of unit one if you want to, um, that 1.2 is probably the bit I'm going to focus on. Okay, this is the syllabus for English communication for scientists, and you can say, see, each unit has a different uh, focus. In our sessions, certainly I'm looking at covering the first three. This is just a reminder, you've seen this before. So we're now on week nine. And in this unit, we're thinking about understanding communication, and identifying your purpose and audience. We come to the verbs, which you've seen before. Again, we're in this top group of verbs, just emboldened. So what did we do last week? Well, we covered effective, not perfect, communication skills or writing skills actually. Effective writing in one sense is simple. It's getting your message across, taking them on your journey, the one that you've planned, explaining what it means. They are all, I suppose, effectively your purposes <laughs> um, of when you're writing. In terms of last week's material, Effective writing is going to be readable. Maybe you're writing for your mum or a friend. Even complicated science. Effective writing is going to have an open style, ordinary words to ordinary people. Didactic style, which is very uh, complicated, um, convoluted. It has lots of big words in it and there's quite a lot of non first person, so it's third person, passive speaker type style, is not open style, and it's not something you want. Effective writing is simple, small words, short sentences, much easier to communicate. It's clear, only have one subject per sentence. If each sentence is a step in your journey, then you only want one step per step, basically. That allows your reader, who is, remember, the one you're actually trying to please and the one you're serving, allows your reader an uninterrupted journey. Effective writing is accurate. It's how it is. A very good friend of mine once said that good science is written down, not written up. And it's something I've carried with me ever since. When we think about writing papers and publishing material, which is one of the focuses of uh, this little course, it's very tempted to gild the lily is the way, an expression I know, I don't know if you have it, but embroider it, make it stronger or better than it is, so you think. Present it in absolutely the best possible light and then a bit. Go for accuracy always how it is, written down, not written up. There is some work you can do in terms of presentation of the actual science, but we'll look at that later. For now, it's as it is. Effective writing has a terse or concise style, as few words as possible, but good words. 
effective reading is progressive. Again, each sentence leads to the next sentence. And effective writing is logical. It's not convoluted. It's straight line, it's linear. Your grandmother could be led through this quite happily. Remember again, your purpose is explaining what it means, getting your message across and taking them on your journey. OK, I'm not going to go through these again because you've seen them before. Effective writing, readable, open style, simple, clear, accurate, terse. The one I like most in here is this final example the ABC database has been subject to different improvements modifications and extensions in structure and content over the years minimum number of words remove stuff that doesn't mean anything remember the redundant phrases you could improve it the ABC database has been improved modified and extended in both structure and content over the years it's a bit better but actually the curators have improved the structure and content of the ABC database. Easy, simple, straightforward. So this slide is really last week. It's the sort of thing that I mean by readable open style. Logical, linear, not convoluted. Again, this is from uh, last week's material and it's uh, abstract actually of a nature paper and I want you just to look at how this proceeds. It's about trace metals in the atmosphere. We've got it in the first line. Looking at this abstract, so the abstract is a map to the paper, each sentence of this abstract leads the writer on. As a quality check, the first sentence and the last sentence are about trace metals and metalloids. So, excellent. We've got a, a joined up paragraph. The first sentence is really talking about the fact that we don't really uh, know very much about inventories of metals. Um, and we need that to assess pollution. Then, what the assumptions currently in play are about how metals get there. Recent studies which impact on that status quo. That in fact, particular organic matter is the dominant component and that 60% of trace metals are in forested regions can be attributed to biogenic origin. Then we'll talk about abstract writing in a later lecture. What he's going to do and then the close of the paragraph. Different steps on the same journey. And again, this is another example of what I meant last week by readable open style. It's obeying the rules. Okay, let's now come on to this week's session. We're going to start talking about motivation and purpose. And I'm going to give you a quote, and actually, I don't know where this quote comes from. I know it's uh, a lyric of a sting song, but actually I know it's come from somewhere else, but I'm not quite sure where, or at least there's debate where. An Englishman says what he means and means what he says. This is a very good definition of clarity. You say what you mean and you mean what you say. So that's clarity. Let's um, define a couple of other terms. Motivation. Motivation is why you want to do what you want to do. For example, maybe you want to write a nature paper. So your motivation is why you want to write a nature paper. That's your motivation. Now, actually, you should be very clear with yourself about this. This is not about Mr. Nice Guy. This is private stuff, but you need to have thought it out before you proceed. You might want to publish in Nature because um, it's got a high impact factor, or it's the next step for your group to you know, put their international marker down. Maybe it sets me apart from colleagues. Maybe it's about my promotion. 
it's not relevant about exactly what your motivation is. There's no right or wrong here. But you need to be very, very clear about exactly why you are writing this paper or whatever it is that you're doing. So clarity, motivation, and motivation is your private motivation. There's also a science motivation, which is the one we're going to be talking about in a moment. And there is purpose. Your purpose. Your purpose is what you want your readers to do after they have read your, your document. Your motivation, both your private motivation and your science motivation, will determine what you want your readers to do, what the purpose of your writing project is. Okay, so purpose. When you communicate, your purpose is not what you want to do. It's what you want your audience to do. So the first really, really big question, if you're trying to get somebody to do something or a group of people to do something, you need to know something about who these people are. And we'll get to that in the next slide or two. If you are going to be um, effective in delivering whatever it is you're going to deliver to make your audience do whatever it is you want them to do, you need to have clarity. So brevity, style, explaining, sharing the information, giving the information, explaining what it means. Your motivation, your personal motivation, is driving this process. But there'll be a science motivation as well. Your personal motivation might be, for instance, to now once and for all this argument about the oxidizing capacity of the atmosphere. It's a science motivation and it's a personal motivation. It's fine. And because everything you do in your writing will be audience centered, it's about capturing your audience's attention and it's about facilitating the understanding of your audience, all of those things then facilitate your purpose, which then gives you the result that you're looking for. Okay, so purpose, part of your purpose is getting your message across. In fact, if you don't get your message across, everything else falls over. So almost all, not almost, all things that you write, one of your purposes will be to get your message across. Otherwise, how can your audience then fulfill the purpose that you have in mind for them? So information is what? That's the, the body of your signs. It, it's, the, it's the information you're giving. Your message and your aim is to get your message across is so what? So what is easy? So what and why and questions like that are more difficult. But there's a subtle difference here between information and message. And everything you write won't just have information. It'll have message because you are trying to get your audience to do something that's your purpose. Okay, so let's think about different types of proposals, uh, different types of writing, first of all, and have a think about the nature of your audience. So, now I've just dug up a list of things I think uh, are, are gonna be relevant to you guys. There's your qualifying exams, your QEs, and or your thesis. Now, your audience, your examiners, and by the way, um, you should entirely think of examiners as people that are there to help you, because they are, um, are going to be scientists. You are most likely to have 
for your QEs and your internal examiners generalists they'll be chemists and they'll be sort of in your vague area but that's it they won't be specialists but there is one time in your life particularly if you're you're doing a PhD which and you're going to think I'm insane you'll never get again my my PhD viva was at Imperial College in London and I was absolutely I can't tell you how scared I was of that viva my supervisor helped in the way the supervisors do. He gave me two very good pieces of advice. One was, Simon, wear your glasses, it adds 50 to your IQ. Thank you, John. And put doctor on your driving license. Not now, both interesting pieces of advice. But that was probably one of the very few times in my life when I got to sit down with the people in whose field my thesis was, and discuss that work with them. So just a general thing about vivas, it's probably a once in a lifetime opportunity. I was supposed to have two externals, but it so happened there was a conference in town during my viva, and I had nine people in my viva. Um, after I got over the total freak out of that, it was one of the best science conversations I'd ever had. So bear in mind there's a silver lining in vivas even though you might not feel it so for your qe type stuff you've probably got you've definitely got scientists and they're probably generalists but not quite specialists for your viva you'd almost certainly have specialists and that's important um what's the purpose of your thesis the purpose of the the viva well it's probably straightforward you think your your purpose is not to be unconvincing and not bulletproof in your science it's a showcase of what a scientist is and what your science science can be and what you are as a scientist okay other types of writing you might do papers again scientists yes specialist and specialist generalist now, what do I mean by this? Um, a specialist in this context is somebody who knows exactly what your paper's about. It's their own area. A generalist is somebody who is a chemist in our context, um, knows something about the area, but that's about it. A specialist generalist is somebody who is a specialist in an area which is related to yours but actually doesn't know much about your particular area and that might sound like an abstraction but it's absolutely not chemistry has got broader and broader because we know more stuff which means Isaac Newton could run across chemistry, mathematics, and physics, and be an expert in all of those areas of polymath. Nowadays, it's quite difficult to cover one area, let alone two, and it's only a very narrow slice of what is chemistry. Um, you might think, oh, but referees will referee my papers. Yeah, of course, but you may not, amongst your referees, have anybody in your particular area. Proposals, much the same as papers. Letters, emails, really, really important. Um, you'll have scientists and you'll have specialists because they're probably people you want to collaborate with. So that's a very different sort of audience to the ones above. Um, public awareness of science. You might have a blog, and in fact, very much suggest you do have a blog. Um, in which case, you've got general public, specialists, generalists, and scientists. So a much wider uh, gamut. And actually, we'll talk in a moment about how we tune what we're going to do for our audience, and particularly don't exclude either the specialists or the, the generalist audience. So 
Purpose is always about getting across what you want to say. To communicate effectively, to achieve your purpose, you must adapt to your audience. And therefore, this slide. Let's now deal with the usually, the usual type of audience, which is mixed generalists and specialists. Remember, we're still trying to get the message across. What things are important for an audience which contains generalists as well as specialists? I think for all audiences, actually, why are you doing this work? It's importance from the literature uh, and maybe personal importance that maybe you've done previous work. So this is crucial. The guys have got to know why you're doing the work. Preferably, what area of science or what hole in science are you closing in or working in? Typically, if you're dealing with journalists, they won't know the number. I'm an atmospheric chemist. For my sins, I happen to know that the atmospheric, uh, and I have good average atmospheric concentration of a hydroxyl radical is maybe 10 to the 6 molecules per cubic centimetre. I don't expect people outside of my area to know that. So, when you're presenting results to a generalist audience, use comparison points. So, the reaction is about twice as fast as that of current approaches with rhodium, blah, 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 or whatever. This type of comparison maybe doesn't help your specialist, but it helps everybody else. And there'll be less specialists in the room, almost certainly, than everybody else. So this use of comparison points in your writing um, or in your presentations, but, but uh, we're talking about writing at the moment, is going to help more people. Analogy. If you've got generalists in your um, audience that will be reading your paper, and you probably will, they certainly probably won't all be specialists. Some specialists, but not all of them. Um, and you want to say that this reaction is much faster. Um, maybe this is much faster. We're replacing the horse and cart with a Ferrari. There's no detail there about what your reaction or what, what it is you're talking about. But the message is very, very clear. What you are proposing is a much faster um, method. And with diagrams. It's always very tempting to get as much information into a diagram as possible, especially when you have got specialists there. No extraneous detail, just fundamental core diagrams showing concept. General pointers for when you know who your audience is, or you can guess who your audience is, tweak the way that you write for that audience. Bear in mind there's also one particular human trait. So, let's imagine, and I'm not, I'm a specialist in applied synchronized swimming. Some people, if they're a specialist in one area, assume that they're also a specialist in every other area. I'm a specialist in A, and they take the label specialist into B, C, and D. Don't get taken in by that. Um, treat them as generalists because in their one or two areas of specialization that's what they will do and you write that way you can't get into trouble for writing like this it makes it more understandable makes the journey easier so there's never a problem however Having said that, that's about keeping the generalists happy. How do we not alienate the specialists? Let's give you an example. Let's imagine we've written, we have opted for connectors made of gold. Gold exhibits both high electrical conductivity and excellent resistance to corrosion. Okay, I did my PhD in electrochemistry or applied electrochemistry. And anybody who's doing that sort of work knows that you use gold contacts for a bundle of reasons. 
you don't want to irritate your specialist readers so there is a device that we use called a subordinate clause so rather than putting both of these sentences at equal priority you instead we've opted for our connectors made of gold yeah that's information you need to give instead of then giving the next bit of information at the same level you subordinate it we've opted for connectors made of gold given its high electrical conductivity and excellent resistance to corrosion your generalists absolutely need to know that they need to know that's why your connectors are gold but this doesn't offend your specialists because um, this essential piece of information essential for the generalists can be boring or patronizing to the specialists so basically in this case what you've done is you've presented all the information all the information is retained but the properties of gold are not presented equally this is a simple example of tweaking your writing so that um, you are writing for your audience okay let's now think about science motivation and hypothesis so usually your science motivation will have come from the literature and the example I might give is has the oxidizing capacity of the atmosphere been constant over geological time it's an atmospheric chemistry question um, but that's one of my current research questions so fine it will come from the literature so it will be somewhere in your introduction and hopefully or your literature search depending on uh, how you structure and we'll talk about that in the next lecture and it'll probably be mentioned in the abstract because that is context that your reader needs so your science motivation if you want to define it in another way why am I spending time and money doing this and the hypothesis or the research question what am I actually testing specifically I'm gathering data to address one particular or a number of particular questions so let's think about examples of science motivation and hypothesis and uh, here is an example of science motivation this is part of a paper by Leah Yu and colleagues in Neri. Low molecular weight dicarboxyl acids are important because they can contribute up to 50% of the organic mass concentration. It's a bit of information. I've not repeated everything or quoted everything. And to specify their effects on radiative forcing of atmospheric aeros aerosols. So they want to know about DCAs because they're important potentially or they want to find out whether they're important in radiative force of atmospheric aerosols airborne dcas contribute to primary sources such as blah 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 biomass burning hence better quantification of dcas versus dcs's in aerosol particles are needed to evaluate their relative concentrations as well as the effects on the atmospheric environment such as visibility, radiative forcing, and there's a list of them. So these are the scientific motivation of this paper, the references to it. The hypothesis, well, they actually tell us what they did. This work examines how biomass burning smoke from central and southern Sumatra region affected concentrations and the distribution of blah 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 in Singapore during a 28 day intensive field campaign in 2008 so the hypothesis is that this biomass burning did or didn't affect these substances which of course have larger importance to the region let's now think further forward because you knowing your purpose you knowing your scientific motivation is going to affect where you put this piece of work because okay 
I'm about to become the editor of Sustainability, which is an international peer-reviewed journal. Um, as an atmospheric chemist, I would not submit a mechanistic, chemical mechanistic paper to sustainability. The aim of the journal is just not anything in that ballpark. So knowing your own purpose, knowing your own scientific motivation, means you then need to look at where you are going to put this work, where it gets the most visibility and the most chance of being accepted. So really, really obvious stuff, boring stuff. Spend time reading papers and work in the area that your work is in. You should be doing this anyway. Or areas where you think your work impinges. And this can be quite creative. Talk about that more in a minute. Obviously network, obviously certain things to find out. And this you should be doing. Even if you're not publishing at the moment, you should be doing this. What others in your area are doing? What approaches to the work are in play elsewhere? Infamously, my father used to use an expression which I feel horrified to find myself using now. No, I don't know why this happens. He said, there are many ways to kill a cat. You don't have to strangle it. Um, attractive, isn't it? But what he meant was that there are many approaches to a given problem. Find out what approaches are in play elsewhere. What are the big questions in your area? Establish whether your work is novel against the backdrop of what else is happening. And if it isn't, how could it be novel? Either what, what presentation angle is there in your writing that it could be novel, applied to maybe a different area, or what changes you're going to have to make or how you're going to develop your work to make it novel. You should look in other people's work for the things that you've done, their explanation of why they are doing the work, what they are trying to prove or disprove, their science motivation and hypothesis, and more to the point, I suppose, um, you need to be able to put your own work in that context too. And no lecture is really, I think, complete without at least one lecture by a famous person. If you can't explain your own science motivation hypothesis simply, you don't understand it well enough. The unrepressible Albert Einstein. Um, and you expect the same from the papers you're reading. If they can't explain what they're doing and why they're doing it simply, possibly they don't understand. Okay, now moving more into preparation for writing your paper. Obviously, you spent time reading the publication you're submitted to. Things you need to find out. What the spread of journals and publications in your area are. And of course, the question here is the publication you're reading, where does it fit in that spread? What are the aims of the publication? You read their home pages. If you go to the home page of a journal, it will tell you what the aims of the journal are, why the journal is there, what sorts of things it wants to publish. You should know that if you're thinking of submitting to that journal. How well thought of is this publication that you're thinking about? I think in other parts of the course this is covered, but again, journal homepages will have on them their impact statistics. Look at them. Find a sector analysis of them. Always useful stuff. You don't want to be publishing in a journal which has zero impact on the field it's in. Look at recent volumes. What have they published lately? Does the editor maybe have a particular focus at the moment? Or foci? And what options does the journal offer for the types of publication? Is it just full research papers? Are there short communications? 
maybe technical letters, new directions, and look at which slot best fits your purpose, the thing that you're writing. Is it a full full on paper or is it short communication? Or is it a technical letter? Then crucially, look at the author guidelines. Please, please look at the author guidelines. You will be surprised as to how many papers I get where the, the authors have not looked at my guidelines. And in fact, as students, don't look at the specification of the work. It's the same problem. Then, no matter how good you think your work is, with those author guidelines in one hand, then you rewrite your piece of work following those guidelines. Some of the guidelines are straightforward. You know, okay, we use um, Harvard referencing, we use whatever. But beyond the simple format stuff, which is important, they'll also have other guidelines there about, okay, papers here are designed to air new ideas or discuss whatever. OK, that's probably at the moment all I want to say in this lecture because you're going to get the experience in the session. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about structure and how to write and deliver, if you like, a standard science paper. And uh, the next week, we're going to look at a different type of output. Remember, as last week, the only things you need to start to write are purpose and audience. So, this week's writing practice. We're staying with your written abstract for your presentation. And it doesn't, it's not going to be a surprise that I'm going to ask you to rewrite your abstract at some point very soon. But last week you had one reader. And your idea was to get them, uh, the objective was to get them uh, enthusiastic enough to come and see one of your presentations. Now you've got three readers. Your first reader is a 60 year old male known internationally as a chemist, editor of an international journal, and you wish to submit a paper to that journal. Maybe not now, maybe in six months' time, but eventually that's the journal you want to publish it. Your second reader is a 30 year old female colleague, maybe who funds a fund, chairs a funding committee in the university or the department that you want to access. Your third reader is a 22 year old environmental science graduate, not even an environmental chemist, um, who wants to work for Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth, hippie type, but is also a freelance newspaper blogger. And again, I'll follow up a little comment I made earlier. Blogging is a very good experience for writing. Anyway, so get a bit more complicated than last week now. You've still got 50 words. You've got to summarise your motivation and the purpose of your research to convince them to come to a talk. And I've used the same idea of a stranger in a lift, but this time you've got to think about what your purpose is, what is the outcome you want, and it means that each of these three 50 words are going to be different. When you've done the three, compare and contrast and use the group, again, have you put your reader on the journey that you've planned by the route you chose to a destination you decided? Now, it may be that 50 words is too few. If you wish, you can extend the number. Of, please, not to a Bible. Maybe take it to 120 words if you really feel that you need to. Because you're still then at abstract size. Anyway. Okay. That's where we're going to end the lecture this week. See you in the session.
For next week, you need to read all of Unit 2 and Unit 3 in the course booklet. And again, this is why writing is difficult. Okay, guys. Cheers. Take care. Bye-bye.